book of Judges, and uh, we're, we're about finished up with old Gideon. He's done, uh, gone the way of all flesh. He, he's, at this point, he pass, gets ready, passes away at the end of this chapter, and uh, he lived a good long life, the Bible said, and, uh, but, uh, Hey, before we do that, have you? Here's what somebody said: Have you ever gone to a drive-through bank teller and ordered a fast food lunch? <laughs> That's something I'd do. I go, wait a minute, you know. That's funny, isn't it? Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, yeah. Enrolling in a night class marked for seniors only, and finding out the attended audience was high school seniors. That's some funny stuff. Like somebody gave me a bunch of these. There are new ones in the last uh, couple, three months. I, every now and then I'll just pick them up and read them and have a little chuckle there. And so we've been in the book of Judges, of course, for uh, months, a couple of three months. And uh, it, it's pretty fascinating watching history unfold. I, I read today... There was a rabbi in California, and he was complaining about the biblical archaeologist. And he didn't like them uh, going around uh, taking new discoveries and uh, uh, alluding that they uh, corresponded with the Bible narrative. Uh, they find stuff all the time that uh, they, he was completely, he was uh, really complaining about those Elba tablets that were discovered there on the mountain where. Uh, Joshua, uh, God gave the message through Joshua, if you do these things, you'll live, but if you don't do them, you're cursed. Well, they, archaeologists were digging around that area, and they found uh, what they believed was Joshua's altar, and then they found these uh, uh, metal plates that had the curse in Hebrew, and they dated back to the day of Joshua. This just happened about six, seven months ago. And so these, this Jewish rabbi, in, of course he's in California, he, he was lamblasting the archaeologists to say, you should not draw conclusions. Well, it is evident that it came from the time frame of Joshua's day. We know that. And then it says it, in Hebrew that Yahweh, which is God, is going to curse you if you don't do these things. And so they don't like that. And so this rabbi says, we need to quit vindicating the Bible, he said. He said, we need to quit giving the Bible so much credibility. I thought, that's why he's in California and stay out there, you know? I mean, y'all, hey, God gave them a gift of their own heart and put a guy like that out there. I mean, what a, what, a, who is he and what is he? Uh, if he, 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 he's mad at his own scripture that he claims belongs to the Jew that testifies of the truth and of God's word. I don't know why he would be so mad, but he is. And so uh, we get into this here and we can find out that uh, there's so many things that are happening that will eventually uh, give you understanding and set up what's going to take place the next thousand years in Israel. This is pre-David. This is post Exodus. And so it's that time period before there was any king, and certainly it's way 500 years before Nebuchadnezzar uh, dropped the hammer on him and destroyed uh, Jerusalem and deported all the Jews to Babylon. So, so to be able to get the Bible narrative in order, uh, it, it's, it's absolutely essential we know what these books say. Hey, Samuel, which is a book coming up after these books, we've already gone through 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, all that, but Samuel is the last judge that we're going to be dealing with. And so he's more than likely alive, and we believe, he, no doubt he is, in Gideon's day. So we get all this going in our heads, and then besides that, we get the revelation of how God deals with people who do what's right versus people who don't do what's right. Now, salvation is by grace through faith. But favor and blessing does, is equated to obedience. 
no less than what parents do. If children, you know, you're, you're born into a family, okay? If, if you do what the parent says, you're going to be blessed. If you don't, you're going to suffer the consequences. Well, I talked to a young man here recently and uh, uh, had a really nice car, and he's a good, good kid. And I said, hey, that's a really nice car. He said, you know what? He said, my parents told me if I continue on uh, that they were going to give me this car in two years. And they said, continue on. He said, yeah, you know, following the rules and doing what's right. I said, hey, man, you better keep going because <laughs> it's not easy to get a car like that uh, trying to work your way forward. He said, well, I work, and he does work all the time, and he does great work. And he goes to school, and he makes good grades. He goes to church, and he does really good serving the Lord. And so God's blessed him by uh, giving him a head start. So uh, we do that. With you, and, and, you know, uh, uh, if, you, if the kid comes in and curses the mom and dad and says, I ain't going to do this, and you're not going to tell me what to do, and, uh, well, you probably lost a lot <laughs> if, that, if you're that kid. Uh, but if you go in there and you honor the parents and obey the rules, you know what happens? God works out a better situation. And so no different than the Lord with his kids. That's no different. He does the same thing. Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. That means every Christian is going to be uh, dealt with uh, on certain issues. We all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And if we say we have no sin, the truth is not in us. We make him a liar. Well, God deals with us, but... That is a good sign that you belong to him. If a person can live like the devil, sin, 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 and nothing happens to them, well, that's not a good sign. <laughs> but if you, hey, it's like I heard a guy one time saying, if you're one of his, God is going to get you to heaven if he has to beat you all the way there. <laughs> and he had a picture of a, 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 a mother uh, walking down the road with a little child and the kid was fussing and, and, and the kid was, uh, a cartoon was mom was dragging that kid and the kid was bouncing in steps being pulled along, you know. Like you're going to the store where I told you it was going, whether you like it or not. You can either go cooperatively or you can go fighting and fussing all the way. Well, it takes years to, I think, apply that, but... Uh, there does come a point, I think, in a Christian's life where you say, you know, uh, God's got his will, I got mine, but it works out if I do God's will better. <laughs> it just comes, finally, it's like a light bulb goes on. And say, I, just, I better just do what God wants all the time. And so Gideon's uh, had to deal with that. And so uh, you recall what he did. They said, we want you to be king. Well, he knew better than that. Because the Lord ruled over them. He told them, he said, Don't, you're not making me king because God ruleth over you. Well, uh, they didn't like that. But they said, well, how about your sons? He said, no, my son's not going to be king either. We're not getting a, a Kennedy dynasty going here. It's just not going to happen. And so they didn't like that. So Gideon, although he was right to reject the kingship because it wasn't God's will, he, his, if you would, his ego... Uh, had him turn in another direction. And so when he gathered all the earrings and all from the people who had collected them from the Midianites there in verse 26, and the weight of the golden earrings that he requested was a 1,700 shekels of gold, besides ornaments and collars and purple raiment that was on the kings of Midian, and besides the chains that were about the camel's neck. So all in all, based on today's financial world, uh, there was about between three hundred and thousand and a half million dollars worth of jewelry, and so he got them to collect all that, and then notice what he did, and Gideon made an ephod thereof. Now, the ephod was only supposed to be worn by the priest. He was right to reject the kingship, the rule over them. But Gideon needed something to make him feel a little better about himself, so he tried to set himself up as a representative priest. He wasn't a priest. He wasn't named a priest. He was a judge. And there was a big difference. God had his line of priests, and Gideon wasn't in it. And the ephod was an, uh, uh, an undergarment 
uh, that uh, you recall that the priest wore, uh, and David had one made of linen, and uh, it was a symbol that you were the spiritual authority because they put the uh, Urim and the Thummim in. The lights and all that we looked over with the, and the computer board lights that it appears that's what they had going. Uh, uh, yeah, if people say, how's that possible? Look, one of the big fallacies I believe will come out when we get to heaven is that we look on these Bible people as people that weren't advanced like we are. And I think when we get to heaven, we're going to find out, boy, did we blow it. They had stuff long before we even thought of it, and they had stuff that we don't have today. I was talking with my granddaughter today, and we was talking about uh, some of the architectural structures around the world. And, and, and we know that in Greece and Athens and, and Jerusalem and Rome, look, they built buildings back there in A.D. Uh, or B.C. and A.D. that are still standing today. Through all the storms, the earth, they're still there. We drive around here, and if a house is, uh, has been moved out of and, and it had uh, two years worth of growth, it pretty much destroys the house. There's one out here. There was one down here on Burgess Road that they let uh, trees grow up through the, uh, the underside of the, uh, uh, what is that underneath there? The what? Eaves, yes. I'm thinking about Adam, so Eve, yeah. <laughs> and, and it went and poked holes through the eaves and poked holes through the roof. And you couldn't even, after about two years, you couldn't even see the house in there anymore. Uh, there's one over in Spanish Fort that uh, 40 years ago, I knew the lady that lived there. Her name was Amzie Vizi. And she, was, she died at 95, but that's been about 30 years ago. And so she had a beautiful home. I mean, it was probably about 24, 2,500 square feet. Uh, hey, when she had it built, it was the best of everything. Well, she died and they, her family, I don't know why they didn't take the house. It's right there on Highway 31. And I watched that thing over the years. I mean, they, it's grown up. It's been destroyed. And finally, I noticed when they paved Highway 31 recently, they bulldozed that house down. And uh, uh, I thought, poor, poor Amy. Of course, she'd been in heaven 30 years. She could care less. <laughs> But she was particular about that house when I knew her. You know, you didn't run around. You certainly, uh, you know, didn't track anything in it. Well, now it's, it, it ended up being nothing but a shell. And that's the kind of architect we have in our modern world. Uh, we don't have hardly any buildings that last 100 years. And uh, what we do is we save parts of brick walls. You go to some of these historical places and they say, we're going to show you a piece of the brick wall that was built in 1620. Well, it wasn't even. We went to the Alden House, my wife and I did, up in Duxbury, Massachusetts, and uh, she she comes from that Alden family, and they were the that what's left of a house, which is we thought was supposed to be a lot, uh, was built by the original Pilgrims. They came over on the Mayflower, 1620. This house was built in 1622. And it says, come see the Alden House. Well, we get in there. turns out that their son and grandson actually built the house we're standing in. But they said, now here's a wall. And they have a piece of glass. And there's about six or seven boards is all that's left. And they said, this is the Alden Estate. The first Mayflower people built their house. There really wasn't nothing there. Now, thank God his grandson, 50, 75 years later, did a little better. But even that's been repaired and replaced. So... You know how that goes. So, so what I'm saying is we, we look back on these Bible people and go, oh, man, you know, and this Gideon, a bunch of cavemen, he's running around with a camel's hair suit on. And, uh, no, 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 no. They had, they were highly uh, involved. And in, I'm fascinated at looking when they do go dig these places up, seeing how they structured walls. Walls still there 3,000 years later. Not knocked down, still there, buried under mounds of sand and dirt. And, but as they dig them away, and you see all the rooms they divided up and how they built their houses, you go, wow, these people had it together. Uh, the, uh, recently, they were talking about in Jerusalem, the, 
these cisterns that they still use, they still use water systems built by Hezekiah. Still in use. In uh, Egypt, one of the uh, uh, oldest sewers in the world, built in about uh, 2300, 2200 B.C., they're still using them. Well, how do these people learn to do all this stuff? Well, they had more sense than we like to give them credit for. And so when we read Bible characters, let's don't get to this point we got them in a different era and they're just a bunch of folks they don't know like we know. When I hear this rabbi saying we shouldn't give credence to the Bible, he's lost as he can be. He, he's lost spiritually. He's lost mentally. He has no clue what he's talking about. He could travel around the world. I know he's got plenty of money to do it. He'd have to be face to face with what's really out there. They weren't backwoods people. They, they never were. So Gideon, he makes this ephod and he put it in, notice, his city, even in Ophrah. And all Israel went thither a whoring after it, which thing became a snare unto Gideon and to his house. Why? Because it symbolizes spiritual authority. And the people wanted to make him king, and he said no. And so he gave them a priest or a semblance of a priest. And what they did, they began to worship the ephod. Uh, it became a flag. In fact, uh, it was known that sometimes they would take the ephod, lay it down horizontally and put it on a pole and it would be stuck outside to represent the priest's home. It's like a flag. And so their old glory was an ephod. And the people went nuts. Now, the reason why? Because God said to them, he told Samuel, he said, Samuel, these people don't want me to rule over them. The reason they want a king is they are tired of me ruling over them. And that's why every time one of the judges died, they went back into debauchery. They turned away from everything they had been blessed with and everything they had, uh, had progress with in serving the Lord. And as soon as that figure that God had put over them, ruling them through the judge, uh, and when he passed away, it says, and they went backwards following those other gods again. So uh, the heart of the people really, they want a government like other people had. And God says, I don't want you to have, he told the children of Israel, I don't want you to have a government like other people have. I want you to realize I'm your king, I'm your ruler. And as long as they allowed that, he gave them peace and prosperity. But uh, they, they couldn't learn. And apparently they're no different uh, than we are. You know, today... Uh, religious people, they, they don't like a church where we all come in and shake hands and we got multiple Sunday school teachers teaching. See, they like a church where there's a guy up there who's waving the incense and speaking in a language they don't understand. It's a religious thing about it. They, they, hey, that's their, that's their old glory of their spiritual life. They, they don't want Bible preaching and teaching and fellowship with the saints with joy. They don't want that. They want somberness, sadness. They want religiousness. And, you know, I've had Catholics come in here and they're stunned when we go around shaking hands with everybody in the middle of the service. What are y'all doing? It's not very sacred. Oh, yes, it is. New Testament fellowship with the saints breaking the bread, all that's spiritual. And so uh, uh, people haven't changed. I don't care if they came in the Old Testament or New Testament. I don't care if they were Bible days or modern days. They still have this desire that don't let God rule over me, but give me something I can focus on religiously. And uh, so he put up that epod. And the Bible says that the whole country and notice the word. That is, a, that is a word used for infidelity or a word used for unfaithfulness. God expected his people to be faithful to him. And when they followed these other things, he said, you've turned your heart from me. And so look at verse 29. Of course, notice it said it became a snare unto Gideon's house. We'll find that out uh, soon. It did. It wrecked him. 
This, this thing became, hey, Gideon, who God took from the wine press and made a great leader, became uh, Jerubbabel. Uh, he ends kind of sad. His life crashed pretty good. Thus was Midian subdued before the children of Israel so that they lifted up their heads no more. God, through Gideon, wiped those Midianites out and the country was in quietness 40 years in the days of Gideon. I wish we could have 40 years in America, don't you? In quietness. 40 years where there's not civil unrest. 40 years where presidents don't get up there and lamb blast other people who don't vote for him as being, uh, you know, uh, some kind of a Nazi. I mean, how can you call 80 million to 100 million people Nazis? Because they, we voted a different way. It's, it shows you that... The uh, hey, we got what we had coming to us, I believe, as a nation. And so, uh, wouldn't you like to have 40 years where the stock market climbed? 40 years where gas prices would go down? 40 years where uh, medical inventions uh, got really progressed and lifespan? I, I, today, I read that the lifespan in 2021 of the uh, American. Uh, has dropped three over three years. It had got up to 79.1, and now it's uh, uh, 76.1. And uh, they say that's COVID. I'm thinking, I don't know if that much is going to be COVID. <laughs> and w- of course, we got people here 90 plus, so, you know, it's like it passed them by. <laughs> Lifespan passed them by. <laughs> I thought that was a... So, uh, the quietness, 40 years. And Jerubbabel, that's the son of Joash, that's Gideon, went and dwelt in his own house. And Gideon had three score. Now, this is not, this is what's messed up. He had three score and ten sons. I couldn't imagine that. Seventy sons? How's that happen? Of his body begotten? For he had many wives? You say, oh, God, no, God had not condoned that. Hey, you're going to find out what Gideon did uh, became a albatross around the nation of Israel. He literally ruined the future of Israel through his actions. He should have gone home, shut up, stayed married, but he had many, many wives and 70 sons. And it ended in tragedy. The whole thing, everything that came from those relationships ended in tragedy. Every one of them. All 70 sons were killed at one time by their own half-brother. <laughs> so you say, well, how did it work out? It didn't work out too good. So notice this. And his concubine that was in Shechem, she also bare him a son. Now this wasn't even his wife. This wasn't one of his wives. This was his girlfriend. And uh, she bare him a son whose name he called Abimelech. So Abimelech became a great troublemaker and is known down through Bible history as being a real problem person. He was actually a nut and a killer, a murderer, a mass murderer. And anybody who do what he did deserved what he got. And he got uh, what he had coming to him. But uh, Gideon... It, it just baffles me to know that God had taken him and used him in a great way and then he didn't have sense enough to get involved in the situations he did. He just didn't have it. And, uh, and then we're going to see there that Gideon, the son of Joash, died in a good old age and that, he, and that the children of Israel turned again and went a-whoring after Balaam and made baal Bereth their god. Now, Balaam is a plural of false deities. It's multiple. Um, I think in Judges chapter 2, turn with me there if you would to verse 13, and we'll see something. Judges 2, 13, just a few pages back. Uh, Because these lands don't serve one false deity. And I'm really drawing conclusions right now about these deities. Are they just ideologies that are represented by uh, art? Or are they, I've always had a problem, do they actually put a statue up of Baal and everybody goes, oh, Baal? Or are they simply the false 
worship systems and religiousness that people follow. And Because uh, in verse 13 of chapter 2, it says, And they forsook the Lord and served Baal, that's the male, and Ashtoreth, that's the female. Baal is basically uh, equivalent to a sun god. And Ashtoreth was uh, a moon god. And so they could be worshiping the sun and the moon. And you would see that uh, that might be uh, astrology. It might be uh, zo the zodiac. Uh, who knows? But in chapter number 8, when they worshiped Balaam, that means they were worshiping plurality of Baals. So they didn't just turn from the Lord and get duped by one false religious system. They were willing to seduce, be seduced by multiple systems. And then particularly they picked out uh, Baal Barith, uh, their God. So while they were in systems of ideology and idolatry, they found one that they really liked to See, man is incurably religious. He's going to have to have something. I uh, heard today that there's a high school teacher said uh, that's teaching religion. He's an atheist teaching religion, which is how the school board could do that. I have no idea. But uh, you'd think if a guy's going to teach religion, he would know uh, enough about one or two of them. But he, according to the student, is... He's just an atheist, and the only one he's critical of is Christianity. He's not as critical about Hinduism and Buddhism. He's okay with that. But Christianity is a myth. And I'm thinking, if you know anything about Hinduism, there's no myth written in children's fairy tale books that can match Hinduism. It is absolutely, it's the most bizarre set of beliefs I don't even know how a mind gets to the point where they can believe that. I mean, I understand how people get duped by different, but Hindu and Buddhism? I mean, you, you have got to deny what your eyes and your own natural mind tells you to get into that stuff. And mainly it's because you reject God, the Almighty Creator. And from there, God gives you up to a reprobate mind. Uh, and there you go. You didn't like to retain God in your knowledge. And he says, I've given you over. So you get these people with these multiple head golden figures. <laughs> Have you ever seen the Hindu? Just multiple. Oh, my goodness. Crazy world. Crazy world. And so uh, they turned again. And notice in verse 34, after all this, the children of Israel re remembered not the Lord their God, who had delivered them out of the hands of all their enemies and on every side. That's a fascinating statement. How could they completely forget Almighty God who gave them miraculous deliverances, not just the Midianites, but all the judges before them. We've read about it. They'd cry unto the Lord and the Lord would deliver them. The Hittites and the, and the Jebus. I mean, every time they got taken over by a foreign country, they'd, oh, Lord, help us. And they'd turn and do right for a while. And then, and then in this case... Gideon's legacy, as soon as the guy died, they said, okay, we don't have to play like this rules anymore. So you can tell you a bunch of, bunch of hypocrites was what they were. They weren't really serving God under Gideon. They were simply tolerating Gideon's leadership. That's all. And, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it didn't work out too well. Uh, so he died in a good old age, and they... they turned her back and notice this they, verse 35 uh, look how people are neither showed they kindness to the house of Jerubal named Gideon according to all the goodness which he had showed unto Israel so they turned on the guy that led them in peace for 40 years they turned away from God they turned away from the guy who led them they discredited him and they started treating his descendants bad because their name was uh, of Jerubal That'd be like 
Uh, and, and, of course, now we see that with uh, Trump. They're treating his kids bad. <laughs> and, 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 of course, uh, Reagan, uh, you know, what if they turn on and, and the Bushes? They hadn't turned on the Bushes yet. But what if all of a sudden everybody started ostracizing George Bush and his family and throwing him in jail and trying to hurt them? We'd go, what a bunch of heathens. Well, that's what they did. The people of Israel did that to Gideon and his family. Well, we'll get into chapter 9 next week. It gets bizarre down towards the end of chapter 9. There's a parable in there that has a lot of lessons not only for uh, Jerusalem and Israel during this time, but it's got lessons of life that we can uh, just, uh, abstract from uh, that you can apply to right here, 2022. Uh, the, the word of the Lord is true. The word of the Lord never changes. And uh, what he says is. And whether we accept it or not, that's our problem. But what he says will come to pass. So we're going to see some of that. Appreciate you coming out tonight. And uh, uh, be praying about all those who are coming off these, uh, these uh, uh, surgery lists and sickness lists. And I think the Lord's raising them up again and bringing them back. We, we're grateful. Let's bow our heads. Lord, we thank you for your word. We pray that as we go forth, we can learn, apply, understand, and accept. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen.